cover environmental psychology first just because I thought it matched really nice with our health psychology from the last unit. But where we're going to spend the majority of our time in this unit is really in the areas of industrial and organizational psychology. And so industrial psychology, we can really think about this as the psychology of companies and how to make a company do better. And one of the things that can really help a company to thrive is not just their product, but also their labor force. And so industrial psychology focuses a lot on the recruitment, retention, and promotion of employees and how a company can thrive by doing this. Now we're talking companies, we're not just talking private industry, we also are talking about government and NGO or nonprofit organizations, and we're also talking about academia. So things like hospitals and school boards also benefit from industrial psychology. And one of the main areas we're going to jump into first is, of course, the recruitment. And before we can even go about recruiting people and hiring people for certain roles in companies, we have to figure out what jobs we actually are hiring for. And this requires a job analysis. And so a job analysis is a four part process. In part one, you are thinking about the job description, especially if this is a developing company or there's a new role, it might be hard to articulate exactly what the job is going to be used for. And so this becomes very essential. You have to think about, okay, what are the tasks the person in this role will need to do? What is their role? What part are they going to play in the company? Are they going to sit on some committees? Are they going to supervise or be supervised? What are the daily tasks and monthly tasks and annual goals? of this job. So that's really the first part. What is the job description? The part two is really the job specifications or what skills and knowledge and aptitude is needed to fulfill those tasks. So now you know what spot in the company is going to be filled by this job. What do you think will be successful to do that task? Does the candidate need a certain education or degree in a certain area? Do they need to have certain work experience? Do they need to have certain types of skills or certain types of personality? Are, are they good at working in teams? Are they good at public speaking? Are they good at leading and making decisions? Are they good at detailed work? And so you want to think about what are the aptitudes required to succeed in those tasks? Important to understand, some things might sound good on paper, but they're not good for a specific job. And so we want to make sure we're matching the skills to actually what will make the job successful. Once we figure out what the skills are and what aptitudes an ideal candidate requires, then we have to come up with a way to measure these. And this is often done through what you're going to screen the resumes for and what questions you're going to ask on the interview. It's important that in job analysis, the interviews are structured and the questions are planned ahead of time and planned very carefully so that they measure and measure with some validity what the aptitude and what the skills of the candidates will be. And finally, a big part of the job analysis is evaluating and putting a value on the position. Every position has value. It might be if it's a really rare position that only a few people would have the skills for, or it's something really common if you're hiring a certain number of people in the field to fill this on your workforce. So some things are more skilled, some things it's harder to get those skills on, and some things are much more common. And so based on that, we're going to come up with a recommended salary, which values the labor and the prestige of the job. So the job analysis is about coming up with what exactly you'll do in the company, what skills are needed, how you will measure those skills in a fair interview, an equitable interview, and what type of dollar value we can really place on those skills. So that's the job analysis and all that is done before the job ad is even placed. Now the job ad's placed and now we get a bunch of applications and resumes coming in and we have to think about the second step of industrial psychology, personnel selection. This is something that, it, for instance, in the federal government in Canada, their personnel selection is a huge branch of the government where they measure and create tests and create ways to screen new government workers. It's the idea they produce not intelligence tests, but aptitude tests and social equity tests. And so what happens here is they conduct very thorough candidate analyses. And so this can be done in the application itself where they might screen the applications for keywords and screen them for certain elements. And then what we might have is so many people make a long list or a short list. And of the long or short list, then we might offer them some additional analyses. For instance, we might encourage applicants to come in and fill out personality tests. And that's because there's some skills that are going to match the personalities. For instance, if you want someone who's very extroverted and who can lead conversation, maybe you don't want to hire someone who scores extremely introverted. Or if you need someone who's really artistic and imaginative, maybe you're not going to hire someone who's really low in openness to experience. 
And so there's a reason behind these personality tests that have to match the job description and the job analysis. Another type of test that might be performed is integrity tests. This is about how you make judgments in really sticky situations. If a coworker drops the ball on a project, how do you respond? If a supervisor is being immoral, what do you do about it? If you are stressed out in the workplace, what's your next step? And so integrity tests ask people about how do you overcome struggles in the workplace? And although personality and integrity tests are interesting, what industrial psychology has discovered is one of the most valid ways to measure which candidates will be most successful on the job is through critiquing a work sample. This is the idea if you're going to hire someone to be a writer, looking at a writing sample is crucial. Or if you're going to hire someone to be a keyboardist and to work with Excel, actually giving them a test on Excel is very important. Or if somebody's going to be hired to be a leader, actually getting them to do a mock exercise with a group of people can be very telling into how they perform on the job. And so it's the idea that the work sample is constructed so it specifically measures the things that were listed out in the tasks that required and the aptitudes we want to measure for those tasks. And it's not something extraneous or fun or just a hazing ritual. It has to be very much tied to the job analysis. Now, when you're going to take the short list of candidates in and you're going to interview them, there's a lot that industrial psychology offers in terms of how to conduct equitable, fair and valid job interviews. For instance, there's a lot of literature about the nature of a structured versus unstructured interview. An unstructured interview is the idea that you're just meeting, getting a feel for the person, seeing the vibe that they have. And you might ask some open-ended questions and see where the conversation goes. Some problems with the unstructured interview is that each one could be very unique and then it's hard to compare the candidates because you see where the conversation goes. Sometimes a person may have something really important that they could have told you, but you didn't ask for it. So now you're not sure where they would be on that skill. Another thing that could happen is that we just might find it easier to talk to some people in a way that's unrelated to the demands of their job. If they're being hired for something that doesn't require them to make really smooth small talk with people, then making that the criterion for the interview is not super valid. And finally, we know that the unstructured interview tends to be discriminatory. We tend to find that there's certain people who tend to succeed at this better. And those historically have been the white straight presenting men. And this is the idea that historically these people have had a bit of a privilege when they walk into the interview versus other groups tend to be at a bit of a detriment and start off a bit behind. So a more equitable way to conduct an interview is through a structured form. A structured form is the idea that you don't attempt to build rapport. Rapport is the idea that you're talking and getting friendly and warming them up. And that's because the rapport tends to happen more easily with people in your demographic group. And people tend to want to hire people that are similar to them, which can be a major bias. And so what happens in a structured interview is you try to not ask any personal questions. You definitely don't ask anything that's illegal and against human rights laws, you, such as marriage, sexual orientation, family status, anything like that. And you also try and stick exactly to script. So you try and stay a bit more formal with them. And that way you're not judging them based on their personal demeanor. You're not judging them based on their friendliness. You're not judging them based on their clothes or anything that would be considered discriminatory. Instead, you're focusing on exactly how they respond to the interview questions or the interview activities, and each interview activity is tied explicitly to an aptitude required for the job. This can make it a lot more stressful for candidates because they feel like there was no chance to warm up and they're harder to read how the interview went, but this is the type of interview process that both federal and provincial governments tend to rely on. Now, outside of the government, we tend to find that a lot of smaller businesses and even lots of fast food franchises, for instance, they tend to rely on things like body language, confidence, and eye contact. So we have to acknowledge how much this can really feed into how we're relating and appreciating a job candidate.